the undefeated champion of the world, the Lord. I love all the warrior talk, the onward Christian soldiers and all that, because today I'm, I'm going to be talking about, uh, uh, about Nehemiah, and there's a battle going on. I'm, I'm fast forwarding to the halfway point, and I told you all about the halfway point. That's when things unravel a little bit. That's when you look down and there's so much rubble on the ground and not enough up front to make you feel good about what you're doing that people begin to get on each other's nerves. It happens. Uh, and it will happen. It's part of what we do. But whenever we try to accomplish something for God, you've got to always remember that there's going to be opposition and lots of it, especially now. There's now more opposition than ever when you start try to accomplish something that God is telling you to do. And, and weak faith will quit, but a stronger faith goes at it with resolution and with confidence and stays focused on the task and finishes the task. Nehemiah is a great explanation of that as you read through his story. So uh, all the warrior talk... Uh, it's great because I've brought you six suggestions from an elite fighting group, the Navy SEALs. They're the best, right? And, and they have ten. They have ten of these, but four of them aren't fit for church. <laughs> They're fit for battle, and I, I, I'd love to tell them to you, so see me on the side. But, uh, but six of them... Are, are really good. I, I just wrote these six down, and they're written everywhere they go. Like if you were to go down to San Diego and El Coronado Island, you would see the Navy SEAL camp where they're trained. And of course, you know they're trained to be elite warriors. And as a matter of fact, if you're sitting on the veranda outside that old, old hotel, that Del Coronado Hotel, and you're sitting there having breakfast, you'll see them run by. They actually are running in, in unison, and they run by, and as they run by, they turn, and they salute the Del Coronado Hotel, and they yell it out. And then they turn, and they go in the ocean, and they disappear. And they swim, like, for half a day. And then they, they come back, and you, you can hear them getting yelled at. It's really pretty awesome to watch. But here's what they said. The only easy day was yesterday. That's good, isn't it? I mean, if you're looking for easy days and lots of happiness and things to go just perfect, yeah, that was all yesterday. And the point is, you've got to grind it out day by day by day. You can't just get in the middle of a day and say, this isn't fair. This is not the way it's supposed to be. My boys love to say, but Dad, that's not fair. And I used to look at them and say, you want fair? It's in October. And it's, a, it's, it's down there, at, you know, and we'll, we'll, go, we'll go to the fair, and you can ride rides. That's the only fair there is. There is no other fair. The second one, get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Everyone wants to be a bodybuilder, don't you? I mean, every once in a while I'll see some guy and he's ripped, and I'll think, yeah, I want to do that. But guess what? I don't want to lift all those weights. So that's why I'm never going to look like that. It's, you know, we, we need to understand that uh, we've got to get comfortable with being uncomfortable, especially in the midst of a build. You know, we've been without our building for a year, but it hasn't mattered because of COVID. But when COVID goes away and we want to fellowship together, we want to be together, it's going to be impossible to do for a while. And it's uncomfortable. And we have to move a whole Sunday school class somewhere else. And that's uncomfortable. You're going to come in some days and there's going to be a sheet of plastic up maybe over the bathroom door. And that's uncomfortable. Get comfortable with being uncomfortable because that's the way life goes. The third one is no plan survives first contact with the enemy. And by that, they don't mean you don't plan. You plan, but you understand that when you, when you engage the enemy, you better get flexible with your plan because it may not be what you expected. There may be more of them than you were counting on. Uh, I love the quote of Mike Tyson. They were talking to Mike Tyson. They were telling him that Hollifield had a plan. He had studied him, and he had a plan to get into the ring and beat him. And Mike Tyson said back to the reporter, he said, well, don't everybody have a plan until I hit him in the mouth. Think about it. 
That, so we gotta, got to understand that when we hit the enemy, whatever your plan is, you better get, better get flexible with it. Uh, all in, all the time. Isn't that great? That's a great saying. Uh, uh, Jim Elliott, the great missionary, said it this way. He said, wherever you are, be all there. One of the saddest things in church, in, in church work, is, is to look around and recognize you got people that are, you know, not really in. I mean, they're here, but they might be here because somebody else is here with them. They're here, and they might be here because they've always been here. Hoorah. Ain't that exciting. But they're not all in, and you can tell it. And, and it hurts your heart when you look and you see that, you know, there are some people that are not, not all in. When we go to the financial part of paying this back, we need everybody to be all in. All in. Not equal amounts of money, but equal amount of sacrifice. So, I love that they say, all in, all the time. And then, the fifth one is, the more you sweat in training, the less you will bleed in combat. Train hard. Train longer. Train harder. For the Christian, it means no more about your Bible than you've ever known. It means no more about your culture than you've ever known. Know your enemy so you know where the, you need to be in terms of how you need to approach the enemy of our soul. And then the sixth one is, I'm never out of the fight. And we never are. As Christians, we're, we're never out of the fight. This is a great quote from Thomas Edison. He said, some people will miss success because it comes dressed in overalls and looks like a lot of work. Right? Most people fade when it comes time to get the job done. And, and, and we, can't, we can't do that. You've got you to stay at it. If we're going to be successful, you've got to stay at it and work hard at it. Well, there are weapons that our enemy uses, and there are basically four of them. And these are the, these are the things that we're going to see in our scripture today in Nehemiah chapter 4. Uh, the first weapon that Satan will use against you, the enemy, is ridicule. He is the inventor of, of ridicule. And he will use that against you, and he will use it against the nation of Israel. We're going to see it. Second thing will be force. When, uh, when things are not going exactly the way you want them to go, the, your enemy comes at you with a force, with a push. Second, the third one is uh, discouragement. That's a, that's a struggle. And that's an enemy to anything that you're attempting to do. And the last one is fear. You know, I, I'm going to have a fit of honesty with you. And, and here it is. I was reading these, and these are the ones you see over and over and over in church. And it creates kind of a holy hole in your heart. You, you people are great, you're amazing. I can't think of better friends to have, better prayer warriors. But, but my level of discouragement that comes from, from the enemy is that, that our church has no children. Nobody's up there. Nobody's in the nursery. No babies are crying. A lot of people, you know, they'll see a baby come in and they'll think, oh, get that baby out of here. I see a baby come in, I, I rejoice. My heart is wounded and hurt as your leader that there are no children here. And I hear the ridicule of the enemy because of that. I feel the same way about youth. There's not one youth here except for Lily. Bless God for Lily. These two young men up here. But we struggled through, what, two youth pastors. Job didn't get done. Didn't get done because hard work comes dressed in overalls. And you're going to miss success unless you work hard. 
But I, I feel ridiculed, ridiculed by the enemy because those things are a part of our church. And when I got here, I was actually told by some members and told by the previous pastor that the thing to do with this church is to simply, simply have it be for those in their senior years. And there's enough seniors being added to the population that, uh, that the church will be full. I don't want a church filled with seniors. And I'm a senior. I want a church that looks like your city. I want a church that has people in it, red and yellow, black and white. I want a church that has children screaming through my sermon so that you miss a little bit of it. So what? Not paying attention half time anyway. I see you nod off. So I, I get ridicule. I get, I get the force that comes against you as well. I remember the first time I was told, even by the ex-pastor, you ought to just make it senior church. That's discouraging. That's not a church. That's a club. And I fear for us. Right kind of fear. So those are the forms of opposition that, that we're going to relate to in Scripture. I'm going to, I'm going to show you the first one. In chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, we see the ridicule of the enemies who are opposing the rebuilding. Now, they've, he has gotten there and he's prayed, he's led the people, he's assessed what the job is that has to be done. He's ready to go after it. And as he does all that, these people begin to come against him with ridicule. Sanballat was very angry when he learned that we were rebuilding the wall. He flew into a rage and mocked the Jews, saying in front of his friends and, and the Samaritan army, army officers, what does this bunch of poor, feeble Jews think they are doing? Do they think that they can build the wall in a single day by just offering a few sacrifices? Do you hear the... You hear the nastiness in that? And Sandoval was a government official for the Samaritans. He hated the Jews. And he's talking to the officers of their army. And he's making fun of the fact that they, they are a group of people that exercises their ministry of worship. Because they, they, they give a few sacrifices, it's going to happen. Do they actually think that they can make something of stone by rubbish, by, by a rubbish heap, and charred ones at that. Then Tobiah, the uh, Ammonite, was, was standing beside him. He's the other official. And he remarked that, that stone wall would collapse if, if even a fox walked along the top of it. It's half done. Now, these are the enemy, and there's another one in there. His name is Grisham, and he was in chapter 3, and he's, a, he's a, from Arabia. So you have these three figures. You have Sandoval, and you have Tobiah, and you have Grisham, and, and they are, they're mocking the people of God. And Satan is the prince of ridicule. You remember when Jesus is on the cross and he's dying? You know what Satan had his enemy do? Mock him. He was mocked by the crowd. He was mocked by the religious leaders of the day. He was mocked by the soldiers. He was mocked by everybody. If your God come down, he was mocked by the two guys who were being crucified on both sides of him. And ridicule can hurt your heart. You know, we say sticks and stones can break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's not true. It's not true. I see people every day come into Hope Works. And they are broken, not over somebody hitting them on the arm and they have to wear a cast until it heals. And when it heals, it heals even stronger. They're broken in their spirit because of the words that they had received from the time they were children. You want to break a person down, you break them down with ridicule, with words. Yeah, sticks and stones, they hurt for a while. But those kind of wounds that come from words 
are the worst kind of hurts. You deal with them throughout your entire life. You know, you believed that your parents were experts on you. And so when they told you you were, worth, you were worthless, you believed it. In marriages, you know, there's a lot of things that kill a marriage, but mostly the tongue. The other things get a little more press, but it's mostly the tongue. It's mostly what is said. Dale Carnegie said, any fool can criticize, condemn, and complain. And most of them do. So the ridiculers get called out in verses 4 through 6. He says, then I prayed, hear us, O God, for we are being mocked. May their scoffing fall back into their own heads. And, and may they themselves become captives in this foreign land. Do not ignore their guilt. Do not blot out their sins, for they have provoked you to anger here in front of the builders. At last, the wall was completed to, to, the, to half its height and around the entire city, for the people had worked with enthusiasm. And so Nehemiah begins to pray, and he prays to God basically the way we pray when we all have an enemy. God, get that person out of my life. Make them a grease spot. Don't forgive their sins. But, but he, his prayer is pretty, pretty smart, pretty heady. Because the first thing he says is, God, just take everything, everything that they're saying and just put it back on them. All the ridicule that they have, show them that that's who they are, not who we are. Place it back on them. I remember getting ready to go on an EE visit, evangelism explosion, and I had to, uh, a, a, a gal on my team and a young single guy and we got in the car, and we're going to pray before we go. Got anything to pray about? And the gal, sharp gal, sitting in the back seat, one of, the, one of our best. She was a single lady, single mom, two kids. And she said, yeah, let's pray that my ex-husband dies. And that single guy started to spin around, and I just grabbed him. Gave him the, and I said, well, you know, we could pray that. We could. But you know, maybe that's not exactly appropriate. And she said, all right, all right. She said, well, let's pray he gets a debilitating disease. <laughs> and he never has another, another healthy day his whole life. He's just miserable for the rest of his life. And the old single guy's like, and I'm thinking, that poor guy's never getting married now. And, uh, and, and so I said, we could pray that. We could pray that. And I said, but, uh, you know, Maybe that's, not the be and th maybe that's not the best. And so she thought about it for a second. She said, I got it. I got it. Let's pray he falls in love with a woman who's just like him. And he marries her, and they're miserable together. I said, we're going to pray that. <laughs> Hallelujah, Jesus. There's one we can go with. And so we prayed that prayer. You know, the interesting thing, it was her, it was her week to share. And... Uh, and when we got to the couple that we were going to share with, they were sitting in a hot tub. And, uh, and they invited us in. You, get, you, know, you go out and you witness, and you'll get into some strange deals. So there, we're, we're out there. They're having a glass of wine. They're sitting in the hot tub. It was her turn to share. And so she shared. And, and the guy was willing, wanting to accept the gospel. And the girl said, nope, nope. And, uh, and she said, what would stop you from such a wonderful offer? She said, hatred for my ex-husband. She said, I want him dead. Boy, that jumped on that girl hard. And me and the guy picked it up, and we had a great visit. And when we got in the car, she wept bitterly. You see, mocking, if you allow it to, it will hurt. And, and, it, and, it, and it hurts at a, at a level that... Uh, that we can't even imagine. And so Nehemiah prayed, and he prayed that the work would continue with great confidence. But then, then uh, that's, that's being ridiculed. Now, let me move to force. Satan never lacks for manpower, by the way. 
When he wants to affect force on you, there's always somebody who will be willing to do it. Satan has bullies anywhere he goes and everywhere he is. It says, but when, when Sanballat and, and Tobiah and the, and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashtonites and the Mosquito Bites heard that the work was going ahead and that, the, and that the gaps in the wall of Jerusalem were being repaired, they were furious. And, and they all made plans to come and fight against Jerusalem and to, and, and to throw us into confusion. But we prayed to our God and guarded the city day and night to protect ourselves. Satan always has somebody... There's never a shortage of manpower that can come against you. And the sad thing is, is when it comes against you and it comes from an unexpected source, they at least knew that source was against them. And God expects us to work as though it all depends on us while knowing that it all depends on him. Ephesians 6.8 says, Pray in the Spirit at all times on every occasion. Stay alert. And, and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. And, and they stood on the wall after that. And everyone that was working had a tool. He would come to work with a tool and a sword. Because they were ready for battle. They had been threatened. And the force kept saying, we're coming against you. And, and in the book, as you read through Nehemiah, you will see they're standing, doing their job, hammering something, putting something together, and at the same time, somebody standing by with a spear. And they were there day and night because there was a force coming against them. When we begin our building, there'll be a force. It won't, they won't come with weapons. They'll come with pieces of paper and stop construction because of this and stop construction because of that and you just pray it through you just keep working like it all depends on you and you recognize that it all depends on God because it's for him and for his glory so then the, the next one is discouragement the attack of the, of the attacking the spirit it says then the people of Judah began to complain here it is we're, we're at halftime uh I don't know if you ever played any ball. Rick knows this. He played ball at SMU, big time ball player there. And, and at halftime, you might get discouraged. The, the not so good coach will discourage you. And he'll, uh, he'll talk about how awful you are, how horrible you played, how bad it was. And you might be discouraged because you know it's true. The good coach will say, well, I'm glad that part's over. Now let's talk about what we do next. Let's talk about getting ahead. And, and, the, and the battle it becomes tough. Look at what it says. The workers are getting tired as there is so much rubble to be moved. We will never be able to build the wall by ourselves. You can get so discouraged that you think, can't do it, can't get it done. And somewhere along the way, you know, the cold water committee shows up and begins to express this as a good idea. So this is the battle moving from the outside, from the mocking of the true enemy, and from the fact that they might want to come against you as a force. You understand that. That's very real. You get it. They don't like you. They've made themselves perfectly clear. But now the attack comes from within comes from inside. Saddest thing in the world is, is when you're trying to operate as a, as a Christian organization or as a church, and here comes the discouragement, not from the outside, but from the inside. And it's, it's a quiet little, I'm going to talk to so-and-so about this, and I'm gonna, it's a prayer request over here, but it's not really a prayer request, it's a gossip request, and it, and it starts happening, and it builds like a wildfire. It's like a, it's like a match thrown into a to a forest. And that's what was happening. Somebody showed up to work and looked at it and said, man, this is more rubble than, than wall. We got no, nowhere to put it. I'm sick of doing this. I don't want to do this anymore. Nehemiah doesn't know what he's doing. And then it starts. So the wonderful thing, though, if you're a great leader, 
You got to look at what Nehemiah doesn't do. Nehemiah does not respond. He tells us this is what was happening, but he doesn't respond. He lets them kind of do their thing. And I think of I think of First Peter when when Peter would say, you know, when when speak, people speak against you falsely, don't try to defend yourself. One of the worst things you can do in any communication is to begin to defend yourself when you're not guilty of anything. The best thing to do is do nothing and let that criticism roll off your back. You know, you, you hear that all the time. Be a little more thick-skinned. And it is good. I'm a recovering people pleaser. And some of you say, yeah, you recovered. Uh, but you fully recovered, kind of gone the other way. But the idea is you can't, you can't answer every issue that discouragement is going to bring up. Best thing to do is just keep moving. Keep moving forward with whoever will come with you. And so that's what he does. And then the next one to attack is fear. Also a horrible thing. Uh, it is the enemy within. And Nehemiah uh, 4, 11 through 14 says, Meanwhile, our enemies were saying, Before they know what's happening, we will swoop down on them and kill them and end their work. And the, and the Jews who lived near the enemy came and told, uh, told us again and again, They will come from all directions and attack us. And so I placed army guards behind the lowest parts of the wall in, in, the ex, in the exposed areas. I stationed people to stand guard by families armed with swords and spears and bows. And then, then as I, I looked over the situation, I called together the nobles and the rest of the people and told them, don't be afraid of the enemy. Remember the Lord. Remember the Lord who is great and glorious and fight and he and and fight your and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. He he's armed he's armed guys that aren't proficient with weapons. Right? These are just normal people. And now they're holding a spear. And so he gives them a little pep talk and says, well, if they come in, you got to do your duty. Tough deal. And I'm sure fear was great. Fear is faith's most natural enemy. It is. And the, just, just the threat of invasion hurts. Do you, remember, do you remember when you were a little kid this is one good thing about having a church that's mostly my age. I can give you an illustration and you get it because you were there. I don't have to be explaining it to any millennials, but I would love to. I would even get new illustrations. But I remember being in the fourth grade and Mrs. Ringwood, we called her Ringworm, never to her face. Uh, she was of, of uh, German descent, so she was a tough teacher. And, uh, and she would, we would have these uh, alarms where the civil defense would come on, right? You remember this? And, and we were told to get under our desk because there's a great possibility that sometime the Russians are going to invade us. And when they invade us, they are winning the war of the atomic bomb. And Mrs. Ringwood would describe the atomic bomb while we're under our seats. And she would say, the Russians are going to come and they're going to drop this giant bomb and it's going to have a mushroom cloud, but it has this cloud below it that spreads out this way. And as it spreads, it eats the flesh off of a human body and you die. And I remember that thing went off and she's going through her deal again. She was such a wonderful teacher. And, uh, and I'm under my desk and I'm thinking, no, not doing this. And I stood up. And I sat down at my desk, and she said, get back under your desk. I said, nope. If my flesh is going to get eat off, it's going to eat off while I'm sitting up. And as soon as I said it, Ray Paver came up, and he sat down. Marty Shoemaker sat down. I knew I was a natural leader. <laughs> we went to the principal's office. And the principal said, boys, what happened? 
So we explained to him what happened. And, uh, and, and I was so emotional, I finished the explanation and said, and I don't like her. <laughs> and, and the principal, I remember, he just kind of listened to us and he looked up and he said, I don't either. <laughs> he said, but that's just going to happen between, between, between us boys, right? So we, the rest of the year, we thought we really had something. Every time we'd see him, he'd give us one of those. I don't know how I survived the fourth grade. I don't know how I survived any grade. I mean, but, but really the fourth grade is the best two years of my life other than that. Um, but the idea is that fear cannot dominate you. If you let it dominate you, you will never become what it is God has you to become. I mean, I talk to people all the time. They're afraid of everything. Oh my gosh, everything is tragic. They live their lives fearing and not in faith. You know, um, I'm trying to figure out if we wore masks for medical reasons or for reasons of fear. Because the science is not clarified on that. Now, Everybody says, wear a mask. You, you know, you wear a mask. I, I, the Apostle Paul says you become all things to all people, that you might win some. And so we all wear masks. So we all have a mask, and, and we wear it, and we wear it to protect other people. And, and that's a good thing, and other people are more comfortable when we have it on. But then our governor comes on, and our governor says, well, you don't have to wear a mask. It's going to be a personal choice. So I wanted to please the governor, so all week I wore my mask like this. That didn't work out very well, but I was pleasing what the governor said and helping people understand that I am wearing a mask. That's silly, I'm sorry. Look at Nehemiah 15 through 18. It says, when our enemy heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had, <clears throat> God had frustrated it, we returned to the wall and each of our own work. From that day on, half of my men did work while, they were, while the other half were equipped with a spear or a shield, bows and armor. And the officers posted themselves behind the people of Judah who were building the wall. And those who carried materials, did their work with one hand and held weapons in the other hand. And each of the builders wore, the, wore his sword as his, at his side as he worked. But the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. You notice when they pushed back against the bully, they won the battle. When the bully came and, and, they, and they essentially said, no, you know what, we're ready for you. And that's true of any bully. Anybody who's intimidating you, when you can prove that you're ready for them, then they fade. They go away. And we've seen military standoffs and all kinds of things. I remember back in the early 60s, the Cuba crisis. You remember all that? And, and they're back and forth, back and forth, and it was going to be the first one to blink. I remember when I was in elementary school, I was in the sixth grade, and there was an eighth grader named Ralphie Middleton. And he would stop us when we were coming in the gate every day and take our milk money because he was strong. And, and I remember I had a, I had a cousin, my cousin's name was Bunky, and he looked like a Bunky. I mean, he was, he was that red-headed kid that looked like he was crazy. You know the one? I mean, he had bright red hair, and you couldn't tell what color his eyes were. They were kind of a different color each time you saw him, and Bunky was big. He would, he would drink a six-pack of double colas every day. And he was a senior in high school. And so I told him about the problem with Ralphie Middleton. And he said, I'll be there tomorrow. And I thought, hey, our problems are over. And we got there, and Ralphie was there, but now he's a little worried because Bunky's there. He doesn't know what to do. And, uh, and, and so Bunky said, go ahead, go ahead. Kept saying, go ahead. 
So Ralphie demanded our money. And I'm waiting for Bunky to show up. And Bunky looked at me and he said, cousin, he said, you go over and hit that boy right in the nose right now. And if you don't, I'm hitting you in the nose. And I'm like, what? That, that wasn't the plan. But what he was telling me is you needed to be the one that was armed. And stupid as I was, I ran in there and, you know, I, I, I hit Ralphie's hands a, a, a bunch of times with my face. But, <laughs> but at the end of the fight, he was humiliated because a sixth grader stood up to him. I'm still mad at Bunky over that. There was no reason. He could have thumped him in the head one time. That would have been the end of it. So they're back on track, and they're working day and night, and we get to verses 19 to 23, and it says, Then I explained to the nobles and to the officials and all of the people, the work is very spread out, and we are widely separated from each other on the wall, along the wall. And when you hear a blast of the trumpet rush Rush to wherever it is sounding. Then our God will fight for us. We, we worked early and late and from sunrise to sunset. And, and half the men were always on guard. I also told everyone living outside the walls to stay in Jerusalem. They brought everybody into camp. And, uh, and, and then he says that that way... They, they, were all, they were all servants and they could help with the guard duty at night and work during the day. And during this time, none of us, not I, nor my relatives, nor my servants, nor the guards who were with me ever took off our clothes. We carried our weapons with us at all times, even when we went for water. Now, he doesn't mean that they wore their clothes all the time. He meant that they never changed by taking their weapons off. Because that would have been a stinky bunch if they never changed their clothes. Did you ever not change your clothes for a long time? I used to have a little league team and, and, and they had a superstition that if you, if you won, you don't wash your uniform. And so all of us decided to do that. Well, you go on a 15, 20 game winning streak and, and you almost win because nobody wants to be around you. <laughs> you step up to the plate and the catcher starts going, what is that smell? <laughs> well, this is a good example. Good example for Christian workers. And, and I, I've, got, I've got four things that I think Nehemiah teaches us. The first one is we got to have a mind to work. We got to have a mind that's ready to labor. We got to have a mind that's ready to help. We need to be servants with our hands, not just servants with our words. We need to stand ready to work. They know this in mission fields. You know, the, the, the most important thing you can do in a mission field is help somehow. If you're over in Africa, if they don't have, a, if they don't have clean water and you build them a water well, you have created a great atmosphere in which to share the gospel. And we, we've got to stay at work. We've got to continue to work. Even if it's going to the grocery store and filling out the list that's on the, on the board to, to, to replenish the, the places that have given away so much food during, during the, the, the frozen tundra we went through. So we have to have a mind to work. We have to have a heart to pray. A heart to pray, to be consistent in our prayer life as we, as we move forward in not just this building, but as a church, we've got to have a heart that wants to pray, that knows it needs to pray, that knows that prayer is the, the working force against any attack from anyone. You'll notice uh, laced through everything that Nehemiah says is we pray. We pray to our God. Our God will take care of us. He will do the fight. He will go before us because we prayed. We pray. And then you have to have an eye to see. 
You know, things, things aren't always the way you think they're going to be. The Navy SEALs are right. You know, you can plan. You can plan your life out. And people do. They, they write it down and they plan what they're going to be when they grow up. And they have this great, exciting plan. And then all of a sudden it doesn't work. It doesn't go that way. That's not what God has for you. And you have to have an eye on what it is that God wants. I say it's an eye that, that is looking for God's favor in what you're putting your hand to. I have people ask me all the time, how do you know God's will? Well, get out there and do something, and if God blesses it, that's probably God's will for your life. So many people think it's got to be this one little specific thing. Well, even with Adam and Eve, you know, she was asking him, what do you want for supper? And, and he said, I don't know, whatever you want to have, you know. And, and she kept pressing on him, what do you want? And he said, uh, fruit salad, hold the apple." You know, God's will for your life is not that big. It's this big and bigger. It's the way it is. And you look back on your life, and yeah, there, there, there may be some regrets that you have because you never got to do this or do that or do the other thing, you know. Uh, but that wasn't what God had for you. And you were over here doing something completely different, and God blessed that. Wherever you see God's hand, hand working, you need to stay at it. You know what? Let me tell you why I'm over HopeWorks. I'm over HopeWorks because we figured out that there needed to be a counseling center that, that was biblically based, that shared the Word of God, and helped people get through emotional issues. Just thought that was the right thing to do. And that coming to see your pastor, your pastor had never been equipped to do that. He's not equipped to listen to what's going on in your head and be, give you good advice. But if you find somebody who God has called into that kind of ministry and they train and they learn and they're just like medical help, then that's awesome. Start a, start a counseling center. And, and so I started it. And the reason I am at it today, as hard as I am at it, is because God's favor was on it from the very start. I remember I hired, a, I hired a young gal. She was a LPC. She was my first employee. But we didn't have a building. But we had an extra room at the pregnancy center. And so I, I sent her to the pregnancy center. And so when, when people would call and they'd want counseling, they would go to the pregnancy center, and she had a little office there. Her first two clients were men with, with a sexual addiction problem. Now, that's when you really want help. When you'll go to a pregnancy center to get your sexual addiction cared for, and you're visiting with a woman therapist. I said, God, you might be in this thing. And so the idea is that you have an eye to see something. Now, don't, don't just take your box and always take your box and have that be your box. If you really want to know what to do with a box, if you're boxed in, and some of us are, if you're boxed in, knock the sides down and begin to dance. That's better use of your box. So you need to have an eye for what's going on in our world. You need to keep an eye on a culture that is not a biblical culture. And the way you do that is you get in there and you understand it and you think about it and you think clearly and you know how to move through that cross culture and, and, in, and in put in to that cross culture, your biblical culture. And you come against things and you fight things when you recognize they're wrong because you also have an ear to hear. The Holy Spirit has given you the truth. You know, the, the, the people of God that I hear talk about how horrible our society is, and I'm not saying that it's not, and how badly it's going. They, they, to listen to him talk, you, you would think they forgot that a biblical worldview is successful. It's like they forgot how great God is. It's like, it's like they forgot that the originators of the Constitution built the whole thing that we do on, biblical, on a biblical basis, on a biblical thought process, on a biblical philosophy. And and, and why we're afraid to throw that out in the culture is beyond me. 
Because it's the only thing that will save your culture. You have to have a mind to work, a heart to pray, an eye to see, and an ear to hear. One of the reasons why everybody was mad at the Jews, you want to know why? Because they were building something bigger and better and more exclusive to God than anything they, the others had. Why were they doing it? Because they were willing to do it. They were willing to work at it. The Samaritans didn't want to do work. The Arabs didn't want to do anything. They just wanted to own that space of their world. And they didn't want these Jews in the middle of their world building something that was magnificent. They were inflicting that culture with a biblical faith. It's what we're supposed to do. The Navy SEAL main motto, I saved it for the last. Improvise. Adapt, overcome. To do that, you got to be ready. Do you realize that 75% of the world lives uh, in countries where, where there is severe restrictions on religion? 75% of the world. And it's not going down, it's going up. And if we stand by and do nothing, it'll be 80%, it'll be 90%, it'll be 100%. But no matter what it is, I will serve Christ. Amen. I will be his, his ambassador to a lost world. But I will not lay down and not present who God is to my world. That was the leadership of Nehemiah. He said, you know what, they're going to ridicule us. Let them ridicule. Let them do that. They're going to push against us and try to make us discouraged. Let them, let, them, let them give that a go. They're going to do all these different things. And as they came on them, what did they do? They improvised. They had a plan. And then he made a new plan. We have to improvise. And the way we improvise is we put a sword on everybody. We give everybody a spear. We work day and night to finish quicker than we thought. We do whatever we got to do to protect ourselves. And, and, if, and we're not going to go looking for a fight, but we're not backing down when one shows up. Pretty good wisdom for today. That was the way they improvised, and then they adapted that into the process. Just pushed it right in there, and they overcame. We need to, we need to be like these builders and warriors of this ancient story of Nehemiah. And our world is so soft compared to other places in the world, compared to other places where Christianity is flourishing. We don't, we don't have to worry about what we say, how we say it. We get a voice. There are people that are attacking that. We get to attack back. We get to defend ourselves and our religious liberty. And we do it with the power of God, with the wisdom of God. And we get to love the world. We get to do it the way Jesus did it. He fought, but he fought with grace. He fought with his words. He fought with his life. Father, help us to recognize that we are in a battle. That the world has declared war against who you are and against your spirit. And Father, we want to declare that you are the one true God, the faithful God. And we want to recognize that people who don't understand that are people who don't know you. And our opportunity is to make you known, to glorify you. And I pray that everything we do, everything we build, everything that we say under this roof is direction to do just that, to take the truth of the gospel into our world, our individual space where we are, and to share it boldly, courageously, and Father, without ceasing. I pray for us in Jesus' name. Amen.